Today we're gonna look at one of the most famous games in chess. It's an opera game. It was actually played by the Paul Morphy. That's a very famous chess player, uh, American chess player in 1870s. Uh, he was traveling around the like, state and Europe to play for various championships. He was about to become a lawyer, but then the civil war came, came in, like he wasn't able to pursue his career. But he's very, very famous in the chess, um, within the chess people and so on. So I'm going to start with the first moves. So e4, e5, that's just a natural beginning. So that's how we start, knight 2 of 3. Uh, yeah, it attacks the pawn on e5, again, naturally developing the pieces. And then d6. d6 is called the fielder defense. What's so special about fielder defense? That's that blocks the bishop on f8. And I consider it like a little bit passive opening. So I always suggest to all my students try to play something more active, whether it's the um, Italian or maybe Sicilian or any other opening, but do not block your pieces yourself. So try to do something more. Uh, beneficial for your pieces. Now the most straightforward um, thread, I, I believe it's d4, that's what Morphe did right now. It attacks the pawn on e5, puts in pressure there, and uh, it forces black to make the choice right away, should they take on d4, should they keep it on e5, so on. So now um, if black simply would move knight to c6, I would always say like just take on e5 and in case if it's knight e5, knight e5, on e5, we're just quite happy to trade a bunch of pieces and to misplace their uh, black king to d8, which will help us to get the bishop to c4. So we develop with temple, we attack on f7, and uh, possibly continue with the long side castle after knight c3, bishop e3, and long side castle. Now, that's not what happened in the game. After g4, black decided to move bishop to g4. Uh, yeah, there's like a couple of ways to continue. There's bishop e2, which will defend and stop that pin from the bishop on g4. There's, I believe, maybe c3 is possible and so on. But Murphy decided to take on e5. That would be my choice as well. Now, uh, in the game, Carol decided to take on f3 which is eliminates the piece which is putting some pressure on the pawn e5. But um, I believe that if it's d takes e5, you have to be extremely careful because what if that happens? Like, I wouldn't suggest to take that free pawn. Again, like I always say, like, you know, we always have to watch out because there are no free material in chess. So typically, uh, people... Do not blunder. Everyone tries to win, and if you see there is a free pawn, like all this, like triple thing, whether it's free or it's not. So can you take it or not? So now, if we take um, knight x e5, oh my god, then we just lose in one move. After queen d1, that's a checkmate. So that would be the saddest checkmate here. So that's why we have to think. Okay, we still want to get this pawn on e5, but we do not want to be checkmated on d1. So what we would do, we would use the queen all the way up to the top, take the queen, takes, and now we could simply take with a double attack on the pawn on f7 and the attack on the uh, bishop on g4. So that gains a pawn for us, and we do not lose to the checkmate. Uh, now we go all the way back. So what happened in the game? After Morphe took this pawn on e5, Ducal decided to take on f3, and after queen takes f3, pawn takes um, e5 right now. So we black is trying to get some control over the d file, while uh, we are maybe hoping to get a uh, scholar's mate. So we would move bishop to c7, threatening queen to takes f7. With the idea to um, checkmate on f7 here. So there is like um, various ways to stop this. Maybe black could do queen d7, queen e7, which blocks the bishop. Uh, queen f6 is a possibility. Black decided to move knight to f6, blocking the maid while um, they're trying to develop their knight right now to f6. So after this, uh, we could try to continue developing with knight c3 or castling. But I always say if you 
feel like, you know, you crossed the beginner's level and you know how to move the pieces. And if you say, like, let's say you're a six, seven hundred player, rated player, like I always say, try to consider to do something different. So yes, we do have the opening principles, which is control the middle, develop your pieces, castle your king, king safety, and so on. But everyone is trying to follow the same kind of principles. So to be able to win, we need to do something a little bit different. So for example, in that position right now, before we castle, we can try to look for the weaknesses. And definitely, this seems like weak. I mean, that's always forever weak. Uh, pawn on f7 and pawn on f2, those are the squares like which are forever weak in the game. And there is another square besides of f7. There is b7, which is not defended as well because light square bishop is gone. Took the knight on f3. Now, after queen takes the queen to b3, it attacks the um, b7 and f7 in the same. Thing. So we could nicely finish already in a few moves if black would make a mistake. So if black would play b6, have a nice pretty checkmate because after bishop f7. Again, always try to check as close as possible to the king. So next to the king versus like, uh, let's say, checking on b5. Because if you do something like bishop b5, there's always a way to block the check. If there's a way to block the check, try not to do that. So uh, try to look always like, how can you actually touch the king? That's my always suggestion. So bishop f7 that checks the king, and now there are two ways to escape. One is king to d7, another is king e7. So after queen e6, it's actually going to be a check king. That's not what happened in the game, but um, it's good to be aware what if. So black decided to move queen e7 in the game. There's a couple of reasons. They're trying to defend f7, and also because white is preparing some kind of attack on the king side and the queen side. Uh, black is hoping that white would take on b7 right now. So black could move queen b4 and actually try to trade queens at the moment. Now it will be a double attack and white would be forced to exchange the queens. That's not what we are, want to do when we are attacking and when we are trying to create some trouble, attack, like kingside attack and so on, we are, when we are trying to win some material, we definitely want to keep the queens on the board because that's what helps us to checkmate in general. So now we're going to move back. So we are not falling for this one on b7. And in general, I'm saying like to all of my students, you want to be like triple careful before you take pawns on b7 or uh, b2. Those two pawns are sometimes very uh, can be very distracting and sometimes people would sacrifice those pawns just to distract your queen not to um you know not to give away some material but just to distract the queen so the queen would not be able to participate you know in the stronger attack or something on the other side of the board so what black did after um yeah uh, what why did after queen e7? Why did knight to c3, which is developing a piece and is defending on e4 at the same time? So uh, black decided to move c6. c6 is controlling b5 and d5 right now. So our knight, like white knight, won't be able to jump to d5 or to b5 to create some further threat. Now, bishop to g5, it's time for us to pin. So we can definitely see that at that point black is very much undeveloped the king is not castled the queen is blocking the bishop so it would take some amount of moves to actually get some development uh, king safety also those pieces on the queen side are not really participating right now so we want to be able to take advantage of their undeveloped pieces so bishop d5 helps us to pin right now now what if b5 if b5 we have a couple of different opportunities to consider the game, like continue the game. But um, after b5, we can see that our bishop c4 is in danger. So if we basically move d5, it will be captured by the pawn. If we would move to e6, it would be captured by the pawn as well. If we would move this bishop all the way to f7, also the queen will take. Oh, we should consider bishop d3, bishop b2, and bishop f1. So if bishop d3, yes, it's going to move back to d3 and defend that pawn. Bishop e2 
again, which kind of defend the king and bishop of one, which is come back to the initial position. Now, what's the drawback of all the moves like that or like all the way here is that the king, uh, queen might get in trouble. So after pawn to a5, there is this pretty much straightforward threat to play a4. And if, let's say, white would ignore it, let's say, just castle right now, after a4, queen a3, b4, that queen can be trapped. So really want to watch out, especially when the queen is on the side of the board. It's not controlling much. So uh, so actually, we go back to the uh, to the initial position. And again, we do have a choice after b5 to remove our bishop and run away or to try to sacrifice the bishop. I always say that, okay, it might be uncomfortable to sacrifice the bishop like for a pawn or for two pawns or a couple pawns and so on, but it might be worse to do that, especially when you are focused and you're very attacking player and you're trying to checkmate, you're trying to put someone in danger and so on. So it's okay to sacrifice pieces if you see that there is a nice outcome. Like pieces are not king, so you you can always sacrifice. So whether it's a pawn or a light piece such as a knight and the bishop. So for example here we would continue with knight takes pawn takes, bishop takes, just like in the other example, one of my videos. So we always trying to sacrifice the knight versus the bishop. So whenever we are trying to put the king in danger, we have to keep the bishops on the board. So bishops are staying because we need some pieces to checkmate. So bishops are staying, that's checks to the king. Um, if king is running away, then we are happily castling right now, putting this king in danger, the king is running, I could still uh, continue with queen c4, put this king more in danger, and it doesn't look very good and promising for black. Uh, what happened in the game, they moved knight to d7, and it's still a threat to move queen to d4, so like, it's still, they're still threatening to do that, that attack would attack the queen and the king at the same time. So we still have to be careful about trading queens here. So what white decided to do, they decided to castle queenside right now. So with castling queenside, we are eliminating the opportunity to um, trading queens right now, as well as we are putting some threat on the knight on d7. So now, if we, again, if you uncastle, if we decide to move simply rook d1, that would still put some pressure on the knight on d7. And probably it's winning, but still, uh, after queen d4, queens will be traded. And so checkmate will probably postpone until the better times. So I'm always for, you know, if you can do two things at one, you know, that's what should be our idea to do. So we would castle right now, that would attack d7. There is a bunch of pins, as you can see our bishops, like white bishops are extremely powerful, like limiting all the black pieces, black king can castle, we cannot do much. Now there are two things which black can do. If black will decide to castle queen side, then we're just going to move bishop a6, and after king c7, we finish nice checkmate because rook is controlling d5. So we just move queen b7, that will be made right now. And if black will decide to move their rook to d8, defending that knight on d7 right now, now this position is one of the most famous positions, which is referred to all the chess puzzle books I know and I read a lot. So um, now we could sacrifice the rook go for the knight on d7. If knight will be taken back, we'll be happily capture the queen right now. If rook will take, we're gonna bring another rook to d1 with more pressure on that uh, rook right now. Now, again, typically we say that rook is stronger because it's more points and like it's stronger than the bishop and the knight and so on. So if we compare knight to the rook or rook uh, to the bishop, rook always kind of wins because it's again it's more flexible and so. On. But it really depends because in that position up here, bishop is block, uh, bishop spinning the rook and the king, 
and it's blocking the king so the king can't really do much it can castle queen is also limiting the king side movement right now so we are actually threatening to get that rook on d7 later on as well so um after rook d1 black decided to move queen e6 so now when we are pinning that piece on d7 the rook here here black decide okay what if i'll try to trade queens and see what happens next well black is trying to trade queens we're not gonna go for queen e6 but even then it's, it's about to continue but that's the yeah that's the position which we've seen all the chess puzzles up here so what we do there we s use our bishop finally we use one of our bishops we kept it until the almost the end of the game like what we needed to take control of those squares finally we take on d7 uh, if queen would take we just get the queen right now but if knight takes here is our beautiful sacrifice so the queen as we can see has the arrows up here gonna move all the way to b8 it seems okay it's almost over black almost found a way to get out from this if white would take just simply e6 point takes this is way better for black because black is the upper piece right now but white actually found this threat queen b8 knight b8 and here comes the checkmate so there's no way to escape bishop on g5 was extremely helpful in that combination right now so it's very very famous very old and very helpful